Uh, hello everybody, and today I'm going to talk about the upcoming edition of uh, Dynamite for AEW All Elite uh, Wrestling tonight. Some people call it All Elite uh, Pro Wrestling, but apparently that's wrong. It's just All Elite Wrestling, but we know it's Pro Wrestling. It's not amateur wrestling, you know, because the storylines involved and the match types and the characters. It's obviously Pro Wrestling. I guess they just leave that out to simplify it. Well, there's several things I want to talk about today. We're going to uh, start out with the news that the WWE has decided to shift their programming there with their counter-programming on Wednesdays with Next. They've gotten rid of that. Apparently, after WrestleMania, they're going to put it on Tuesdays, which I think is a good idea because they're getting slaughtered against uh, AEW Dynamite. I mean, obviously, the WWE is on a very steep downward trajectory. As even David Meltzer says on the uh, Wrestling Observer Live, the premiere wrestling newsletter has been for the last 30 years the the ratings for the WWE in such a steep decline that um, AEW will either um, equal those overall like getting them all together or will surpass them by fall because it's kind of like the US dollar versus other currencies the Canadian dollar up here for example it's not so much that the Canadian dollar is getting a lot stronger it's the fact that the American dollar is a lot weaker has been over the last 20 years and that's why other currencies are catching up with it and even surpassing it, like the euro. It's not a function of their strengths, but more a function of the American dollar's weakness. Or in this case, uh, AEW does have an upward trajectory, but it's not phenomenally strong right now. You know, it's building on its success from year to year, obviously. But it's more a function that the WWE, former WWF, is so weak. It's alienated its audience over the last 20 years, in particular the last 10 and they failed to make any big stars. John Cena was arguably their last big star, but even he wasn't on the level of a Rock or an Austin or a Hogan or arguably a Flair or an Undertaker, but I don't really count Flair and Undertaker, especially Flair, because in my opinion he is not on the same level, you know, in terms of mainstream popularity with casual fans as a Hogan or a Rock or an Austin or arguably to a degree even the Undertaker, so... Yeah, he's not. A, he's more on the level of a Bret Hart or a Shawn Michaels, perhaps even a little less, because outside of people who are really into wrestling, especially uh, Southern wrestling, you know, in the Southern U.S., a lot of people don't know who Ric Flair is if, if you ask him on the street. I mean, they'd be more likely to know even more who the Macho Man or Roddy Piper is because of their mainstream appeal, you know, crossover with, like, movies and TV shows back in the day, in particular the Macho Man, than they would know who uh, Ric Flair is. So I would put John Cena on the level of a Flair, possibly even a bit lower, more on the levels of uh, Shawn Michaels or uh, Bret Hart. A big star within wrestling from about 2000 to 2010, uh, peaking around... 2005 to 2008, um, even arguably continuing up to about 2015, but um, no, uh, he's, you know, is he on the level of a guy like a Rock or a Hogan or an Austin where you go aside of wrestling or even a Macho Man, you ask, like, you know, like, do you know who John Cena is? So aside of children or people that grew up during that time, probably not. Your average person would know. So, yeah, I never really kind of flair, you know, flair in there, and, and I count Cena as a, as a Bret Hart type, you know, well-known in wrestling or Shawn Michaels, but outside of that, very little penetration of popularity. So, and, and since him, they haven't even had a semi-popular guy. I mean, they have got, you know, the guys today, you go out and you ask, like, somebody who, like, a guy like a Drew McIntyre is. I mean, the only reason I know is because I follow wrestling. And look at the results, even though I haven't watched the WWE in at least five years, you know, for not, not, not more than a passing interest. Um, you ask him who like a guy like a Drew McIntyre is, or a Sheamus, or, a, or even a Roman Reigns, they would have no idea. Your average person on the street would have even less idea who Cena was. So Th That's a big problem they have. They just can't make new stars. Where, you know, like, AEW has made, like, Orange Cassidy, obviously. They made, like, Darby Allin. All these guys are getting to the cusp of getting crossover appeal. I mean, they're very popular in wrestling, and now people on the street are getting to know who they are, and they're capturing the young demographic. As, uh, as evident by the records of the ratings that AEW has got. So they're doing a great job of capturing that all-important 18 to 4, you know, 30, 40, you know, 44, some people count as 49 demographic. They're getting the younger to the early middle age demographic. They're, they're grabbing them. And that's what you need. You need the kids and the teenagers so that they translate in 20 years into 
you know, the young adult fans, that's what you need. You need to grab those so you can build to the future. And AEW has done a fantastic job with that. With guys like Darby Allen and Orange Cassidy and, and a few others. I'd even argue that MJF, I know my, uh, <laughs> one person I know, I won't say who, really, really hates him, calls him the mf -er. I think I mentioned that before. Um, but he, um, he does do his role good as a kind of a, you know, chicken shit, you know, disgusting heel, kind of a Roddy Piper type back in the day. He does do that job good, so, yeah. Uh, he has less crossover popularity, obviously heels always will, but um, they're getting those hot young stars with the hot young angles, and that are um, grabbing the attention of the younger uh, audience, and they're going to build on that, and it's building to great success. Whereas most of the WWE fans, once they have laughter, like in their 50s and older, so they're just a lot of people just watch it to habit. I'm sure in that demographic. So that demographic's like aging out. We have the uh, AEW's audience is aging in. But I digress. I really didn't want to get into uh, analysis of ratings or what's going on. You know why the WWE is moving like their third tier show. I mean even their second tier show probably would have failed against AEW Dynamite. Of why they're moving it. To Tuesday, it's because obviously they'll, they'll never like admit it, but they were defeated. They were completely defeated. You know, most weeks AEW easily trounced them in the ratings. I mean, even that week when they lost like the signal, like most people did in like the U.S. halfway through the program, still uh, they still just barely you know beat the WWE product. That shows how weak you know the WWE product is. But anyway, I digress. So yeah, they'll never they'll never they'll never admit that's what's going on, but. It is, it is. It's, it's uh, them admitting defeat. They're in steep decline. They're collapsing. But now getting on to AEW itself and this all-important Crossroads uh, Dynamite, you know, before their Revolution special on Sunday, March 7th. Um, we'll, go, we'll start first with, in my opinion, probably the most important match is the tag match that's going to apparently open it, I've been told. Of uh, Cody Rhodes and Red Velvet taking on uh, Jade Cargill and uh, Shaq Shaquille O'Neal. Um, this match has to deliver. I mean, we don't know what the level of wrestling ability Shaq or Jade have. We don't really know. I mean, it's going to be interesting, in my opinion, either way. You know, either if they know what they're doing or they don't. You know, in the, in the latter case, for all the wrong reasons, it'll become more comedic. But this match has to deliver after all the hype they poured in, uh, you know, they poured into it. I mean, originally it was going to be Brandy, but she obviously can't be part of this match. So, you know, they had to shift gears a couple of times. Then they wanted to place it for a while, seemingly on the pay-per-view. But now they want to give it away on the pre-show and the special the week before. Um, I think that's a good, that's a good uh, choice on the part of AEW management. Uh, simply because you have more eyeballs beyond it on free TV. And uh, I also think, besides delivering in the ring and telling uh, a good story there, these people knowing what they're doing, to, you know, enough to put on a good match, you know, at least one that makes sense, you know, not flubbing anything or a whole bunch of botches and become laughably bad. Uh, the fact that they now have the big show, you know, a.k.a. Paul Weiss signed, and he has that history from both the last decade where a couple times the WWE teased a showdown between him and Sha Shaquille O'Neal, something has to happen with the big show he's going to be there they've advertised him and something's got to happen either during that match or after that match some kind of confrontation between him and Shaq or a promo or something's got to happen it's a golden opportunity you know they can't pass it up I know Shaq isn't a regular wrestler and I know the big show is kind of semi-retired but something's got to happen between Shaq and Paul White they got to build on that they got to show like hey look the WWE flubbed this they blew it they had you know when these guys were even younger and you know in better shape they blew this you know, we're going to do something. I mean, they could do like a cinematic match, they call it. You know, they've gotten popular the last year or so with the pandemic. Where it's all like filmed behind the scenes. And, you know, it's not really a match. It's kind of like a mini-movie. Like they did with The Undertaker when he retired over in the E. Or like they did with the Tooth and Nail match with uh, Britt Baker there and Big Swole. Not my favorite match, you know, in the dentist's office. But, but it was still somewhat interesting. That They need to do something like that where it's obviously just like a mini-movie. It isn't even like as real as, quote-unquote, as a re uh, typical wrestling match. They could do something like that to protect them both, keep them from injury, and kind of hide their weaknesses, you know, that they're both getting older and, you know, the big shows... You know, was at least last couple of years before I left E was pretty much out of shape. 
they, they can do something like that if they have them face each other down the road, but Paul White, the big show, has to be involved in this tonight if they want to capitalize on signing him. I mean, if they're just bringing him in, as I said in my last video, just to host this dark elevation on Monday night, that that's a waste. That's a waste if they're just bringing him in for that, sh you know, show. Complete waste of, um, of bringing him in, of the money they've spent, and what talent he has left in some in, in name appeal to draw in fans. Today, the perfect opportunity. They've got to put on a good match in that tag match opener. And they have to get the big show somehow involved either during or after that match. Some kind of confrontation with Shaquille O'Neal has to happen to tease that match if they can get Shaq to uh, commit to it. That would just show, hey, look, we can do what the WWE did. And they, they teased this for years when these guys were obviously more in their prime and they failed. But we're going to give you this, consolation prize. That's what they got to do. Now, uh, moving on to some of the other matches tonight. <laughs> I have a big problem with how they've been booking the AEW's women division. I mean, it looks like, because they had Nyla Rose basically advance to the end on the um, American side, the brackets, I'm nothing against her personally, but she just defeated her three times by my count for the title. There is absolutely no point in she to fight facing her again. And Vicky, their manager, the Aguero seemed to disappear, so there's not even that hook, because Vicky was kind of making up for her lack of mic skills. But that's gone now, too. So it makes it even more pointless to have her, you know, Hikaru Shido face her again, especially at this big pay-per-view. Uh, the only other option now is the um, woman on the um, Japanese side, um, Ryo Girio, or something like that. Um, I'm not very familiar with the name. But it was kind of like a, a little bit smaller there than Edge Con was. You know, she's got the whole, you know, tough bulldozer gimmick going on. Um, apparently, she's going to move to Florida. So, you know, like Rio wants to spend some more time in Japan, apparently. And uh, Makito and some other people that were involved in Japanese side want to spend more time in Japan. So they're not, um, like, Rio actually does live in the U.S., but she's actually going to um, go, uh, you know, has a home there. But she's, as we all know, but she actually wants to go back to Japan for a while. But anyway, the point being that uh, this girl here that um, Nyla Rose is facing on the other side of the brackets in the final tonight to determine who's going to fight Sheeta for the title, she wants to apparently move to Florida. So maybe that's an indicator, you know, tip of the hand, you know, we know behind the scenes that she's going to win. She, of the two choices left, she'd be the better, but it's still a weak choice simply because Nyla has been defeated so many times by Sheeta and hasn't even come close to defeating her, so there's no point there in having, you know, Nyla, Sheeta, and bye-bye reckoning number four. But um, this Girio, I believe, like they, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing the name, fighting Ishida, I'm not sure what kind of mainstream appeal this will have, especially after tonight where you might be having a lot of new eyeballs on the product, at least the highlights, if not the whole pay-per-view. I mean, you have Ishida, who's mainly a Japanese wrestler. I mean, top, she's got that whole Temple uh, Warrior going on, you know, Temple Dancer Warrior thing going on. But do you really want... Uh, one Japanese wrestler who's, you know, who's well-known in wrestling circles, but not really in the U.S., you know, great champion. If you want her fighting an other Japanese wrestler who's even less known, I mean, it's a complete unknown quantity. I mean, I can't find much on her when I look her up, even over there. Do you really want these two to be, you know, basically the face of your division, the women's division, on this big pay-per-view special? I mean, really, I've been, I talked about this in the last video. You want, uh, I would have put... Rio in there even if I could have. I would have put Britt Baker even in there that I w could have. Uh, apparently part of the reason that not, um, Thunder Rosa, you know, because she's basically on loan from Mexico there, like AAA, the reason she didn't win, that she was defeated in the semifinals on the American side of the bracket by Nyla is because she wants to go home to Mexico and fight them for the uh, NWA. So that's the reason that uh, she is not going to be there. Uh, I'm hoping they have some kind of ace up their sleeve. There is always a possibility, I mean, we've heard some rumors, rumblings over the last six months to about a year, that they might be going to sign uh, Tessa Blanchard, you know, who's the daughter of Tully Blanchard, who managed uh, FTR, who had that run in Impact, where they actually put the world title on her. You know, she's the first woman to have the world title. A lot of people didn't like that, but like it or lump it, she did get a lot of press from that. And uh, she's a free agent. Of course, the WWE also apparently is after her. But maybe they're going to bring her in and have her challenge the winner or maybe beat up one of, you know, maybe beat up Gario and, and challenge Sheeta. Now that could be interesting, but I don't see Gario and Sheeta or Sheeta and Nyla being a draw. I really don't. Uh, I, I myself, even as a hardcore wrestling fan, you're a diehard, I don't have a lot of interest in it. 
I mean, one, you have Sheeta facing an unknown, and you know, who, you know, has a language barrier and all those other problems. Also, isn't even that well known in Japan to a great degree. And then you have her fighting Nyla for the fourth time, which she's defeated three times before, and with, with no story basically going into it. Not even come close to defeating her. You know, so both options seem very, very weak. I mean. The AEW women's division has seemed to be an afterthought, unfortunately, during the first year to now year and a half of the company's life. Uh, this would seem to only reinforce that stereotype that they don't really seem to care about their women wrestlers. I mean, I know they want to bring more in from Japan, more from Mexico, you know, before the pandemic struck last spring, but they've had a whole year to compensate for that with their booking. And either option they have, especially when they put this whole tournament through, you know, all this effort into it, seems to... Um, be lackluster, and I, and I don't like either option that we have right now. I'm not saying that uh, Gario there, uh, like I say once again, forgive me for mispronouncing your name, and Nyla won't put on a probably a bang or a good match tonight, and she don't put on a good match with whoever, you know, who is her opponent for Revolution on March 7th, but uh, I don't know. They're, it just doesn't seem to have mass appeal and doesn't even hold my interest. So, uh, after we went through this tournament, I mean, all the interesting choices of who could face uh, Sheeta for the title have been um, knocked out of contention. So, I really don't see the point. Uh, I don't. Uh, I know that Kenny, you know, because of his time in Japan and the Young Bucks as well, Matt Hardy and all of them, that they are big fans of, uh, you know, Joshi or Japanese women wrestling, you know, world well, Mexican women wrestling. They're, they're big fans of that. But these options are pretty much off the table, unfortunately, have been, or have been greatly reduced due to you know, the pandemic issues and, you know, things like cross-border and international travel. So, I don't know. Unless they bring, like, some kind of surprise in it, like Tessa Blanchard or something, you know, last minute either, you know, during the match or after to challenge whoever the winner is and get us some interest. You know, I don't really, I, I, I'm really ve feeling very lukewarm on the current state of the women's division, in particular the title scene and where it's going. Uh, I'm quite skeptical of it. Okay, and then we're going to have uh, Jericho and the MF, or, you know, MJF. Uh, they were going to give their little press conference and why they beat up uh, the father of the Young Bucks. We all know who that is and why they beat him up. And uh, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really feeling this. I'm having, a, I'm having a suspicion, a great suspicion, that they're going to put the title, uh, you know, the tag team titles on. The MF or in Jericho. You know, Jericho's doing nothing for me in his current incarnation of uh, basically a fat or a shape over the hill Ozzy Osbourne type rocker. I mean, Ozzy does, you know, Ozzy isn't even as incompetent as Jericho has portrayed himself to be here lately. So I'm not feeling this at all. The main reason I think that the title will get placed on uh, the Inner Circle members is because. We know that the Young Bucks have some nagging injuries, especially Nick, I believe, with his leg. You know, it could be Matt. Sometimes get them mixed up, but I'm pretty sure it's Nick has the leg injury that's been nagging for a while. I thought they'd even uh, drop the uh, belts maybe back to FTR or to perhaps even a top flight or the Acclaim, but they didn't. So uh, this would be a perfect chance for them to rehab their nagging injuries and take a bit of a break. And I guess they, you know, would forward the Inner Circle storyline, which I really don't care about, because it seems inevitable what's going to happen. I suppose Sammy could come back if he could get over his backstage problems and screw them out of the title. You know, they're about to win by cheating or something. But I'm um, kind of lukewarm in this. Not quite as lukewarm as, uh, fortunately, is on the women's division, but uh, this also really isn't holding my interest. And you, then you have... Um, um, a match, singles match with basically no storyline. You have like a Platinum Max Caster, the Acclaim, fighting number 10 of the Dark Order. Uh, I suppose you got the Hangman stuff with the Dark Order, Matt Hardy and all that, you know, kind of secondary because he's involved with them now, the, kind of in that odd again, off again relationship. Uh, but this match has like basically no storyline going into it. The Acclaim really isn't aligned with like Matt right now, so I don't really see what the point of any of this is. Um, I'm not even, probably 10 will win, uh, maybe Castro will win, I don't really care either way to be honest, uh, I'm quite skeptical of where that's going or if it has any direction at all, it's just some kind of filler match, uh, so moving on, probably what will be the main event I suspect will be FTR uh, with, with the manager Tully versus Jurassic Express, uh, 
Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy with Marco Stunt. This I am excited for. I, I think probably FTR and Tully will get the win simply because they've been coming up more or less, you know, except for that beatdown, you know, where they stripped off the horns of Luchasaurus for his mask. They've been coming, you know, and they abducted um, Mark, of course. But in ring, they've been coming, like, out on the short end of the stick, and they get some heat for some kind of match they'll probably announce tonight for uh, Revolution on March 7th. I'm suspecting that uh, they'll get the win by hook or crook, by guy crook, probably cheating, uh, isolating Marco, or, you know, beating him up or something like that, you know. That, uh, that I am somewhat interested in where that's going. I'll be interested to see how they forward other storylines, like what's going on with Orange Cassidy and Chuck Taylor and Miro and Kip Sabian and Penelope. Though Penelope's kind of like the odd person out in that feud because they don't have like a female equivalent on like uh, the other side for her to fight. So I guess she's just relegated, even though they have her in the match graphic. I guess, you know, for Revolution, I guess she's just relegated to Valet. So, you know, because where it's a two on three, you might as well say with no analog on that side, especially there's no point in that. So uh, I'm very excited overall, though, for tonight, despite the fact that I'm a little lukewarm in the women's and tag team um, divisions right now, what's going on with them. I'm a little, you know, I'm, I'm probably missing a match or two. I, I think there's something going on with uh, Phoenix and Archer. They had a great match last uh, week to um, end Dynamite. But, yeah, I think tonight is going to be a major uh, turning point. You know, no pun intended with the whole Crossroads title for the episode. Uh, they have a chance with Shaq and the Big Show there, you know, for Big Show for the casual wrestling audience and Shaq for the crossover from other sports and general entertainment. With those two crossover audience potentials, they have, and also the announcement about what's going on with the WWE moving that next away so it's not competing anymore with Dynamite. And, you know, one show away, you know, the go-home show, the pay-per-view, all these things are colliding both with uh, the diehards and with the casual potential audience to get a lot of eyeballs on the product tonight. And they've got to put on a strong show from beginning to end. In particular, they got to hook people in with something strong in that tag match to beginning. they got to also use Paul White to, you know, the big show to full advantage. They And then uh, from there, they got to go. they got to hit the ground running. they got to, everything's got to be bang on tonight. This, you know, they're going to have a lot of new eyeballs on their product, I suspect, from different quarters. And if they want to retain some of that interest, there's going to have to be uh, good booking decisions made and a great presentation. Um, they've usually delivered in the past. They've had a few hiccups here and there. So I am, I am confident they will put on a relatively good show tonight. But... Uh, I'm, I'm hoping they go, or even a great show, but I'm hoping they go beyond that. It has to be fantastic, hit it over the park. This has to be just a blockbuster. That's what it has to be from beginning to end, in particular that beginning and that end. And they also need to not taper off in the middle. I'm a little skeptical about the uh, women's match because there's no build going into it and storylines and who's involved. I'm kind of skeptical if it will hold the interest. You know, in the middle of the card, I'm also kind of a little bit hesitant about the whole thing with um, with Jericho and, M and MJF. If they can hold the interest, uh, you know, to a lesser degree. I'm skeptical of that too, but uh, I hope I am pleasantly surprised. And uh, on Saturday, I will give everyone my thoughts of how I thought uh, everything went down and if it lived up to the hype and what I was hoping it would be or if it uh, failed. Anyway... Stay frosty, everyone.